Amber Cove Publishing presents The Secrets of Supervillainy, the Supervillainy series, Book Three, written by C. T. Phipps, performed by Jeffrey Kafer. Chapter One, always open with a big fight scene. Sister Christian's eyes glowed, and she laughed before shooting a column of flame in my head. Her attempt to kill me with fire didn't work out quite the way she expected. Instead, it resulted in her flames striking against my own conjured snowstorm. Dropping my briefcase full of stolen diamonds, I held up my arm and used it as a shield while throwing every bit of magic I could into producing an icy defense. The results were a massive cloud of steam that blanketed the entirety of the room. If you're wondering why I was having a fight with a woman who owed royalties to Night Ranger for the misuse of their song in the middle of an abandoned cathedral, it was part of a much larger story that can be summarized as me trying to buy a magic rock which could resurrect my late wife Mandy. I am Gary Karkovsky, a.k.a. Merciless, the supervillain without mercy. Trademark. And I'm not going to let a silly thing like death stop me from bringing my wife back, especially since I was Death's number one minion. Gary, look out! Cindy called as she threw the London werewolf over her shoulder with a judo throw. Cindy Wachowski, a.k.a. Red Riding Hood, a.k.a. my favorite henchwench, had cleaned up her act tremendously since Mandy's death. Cindy had returned to medicine and now spent a lot of her time treating the destitute in a free clinic. She'd also given up all... Okay, some of her ill-gotten gains to help disadvantaged students complete their degrees in medicine. Perhaps the craziest part is she'd taken to fighting crime as well, serving as a semi-noble superheroine in between helping me and my various schemes against the city's rich. I didn't know how she managed to find time for it all. That woman loves you. I hope you realize that. Cloak, my, well, magic cloak, said... He was the ghost of the superhero known as the Nightwalker, and the only source of sanity in my otherwise insane life. Not that I listened to him much. We're not like that, I said, feeling the steam burn the side of my face. Perhaps you could be if you were willing to give it a chance. I sighed, shaking my head and wiping some water from my face. I'm a married man. I see. I could tell Cloak didn't. He seemed to think this was my going through the various stages of grief, that Mandy was someone I would eventually accept the death of, that I'd move on to someone else. I loved Cindy, maybe as much as I'd loved my ex fiance Gabrielle, but Mandy was my life. I'd gotten her killed, and I couldn't stop until I made this right. If I couldn't, if she really was gone forever, then I didn't deserve to be happy. Oh, Gary, Cloak said, hearing my thoughts. Forget you heard that, I said, dodging behind a pew as Sister Christian, dressed up today as a fetish wear version of a nun's attire, flew over the steam cloud and threw a storm of fireballs down at me. I barely managed to stay ahead of them, feeling like someone dodging out of the way of a World War II plane's gunfire in an Indiana Jones pastiche. The Stone of Eldra is mine, Merciless! The left-handed Bokor laughed, his zombie henchmen moaning despite their mouths being sewn shut. He was the guy responsible for Sister Christian, the London werewolf, and all the other guys trying to kill us right now. He was also the guy I'd been trying to buy the magic rock from. No force on earth or the heavens will separate it from my power. The left-handed Bokor defined stereotype for a voodoo-practicing wizard by looking more like Jay-Z than Baron Samidi. He wore a $10,000 white suit and shoes with a Panama hat that seemed to shine every bit as much as the diamonds on his twelve or so rings. All of them contained imprisoned souls he drained for energy. One of the downsides of my ghost-themed powers was I could hear them moaning from here. "'You offered to sell the stone to me, numbnuts!' I shouted, not really up to my usual game insult-wise. "'We've all been hurting since the fall. I got a better offer!' the Bokor shouted. It had been a year since the fall, when Falcon Crest City was overrun by zombies, the great beast Zul Barbus killed, and the Brotherhood of Infamy destroyed. None of it mattered, because it had come at the cost of what I treasured most in the world. Mandy Karkovsky, my wife, had died sacrificing herself to save my best friend Cindy. I hadn't taken it lying down, and it had resulted in her resurrection. Of sorts. 
Despite what comic books and television have portrayed, death is not as easy a thing to recover from in our world. Cloak continued to speak. It may be time to let Mandy go. Never! I hissed under my breath, throwing a blast of ice up in a sister Christian's face, which blinded her and sent her flying backwards against the stone walls behind me. Also, stop distracting me! Oh, you can take a second stringer like the Boko out easily enough, Cloak said. It's more important we discuss your love life. Ha <laughs> ha, very funny, I snapped. I'm not a second stringer, the Bokor shouted, firing hex bolts of green energy from his hands at my head. I ducked under them and they slammed into the altar behind me, transforming it into a hideously misshapen lump of rock. You heard that, huh? I said, preparing a fireball to burn him to ashes. If I couldn't buy the Stone of Eldorah from him, then I guessed I'd have to take it from his cold, dead body. Roar! The London werewolf tried again to go after Cindy, only to have a fire axe buried into its shoulder as she dodged out of the way of zombie gunfire, shooting them up one after the other with bullets that tore through the spells keeping them animated. Feel the power of Loa! The Bokor chuckled, pulling out a wand and sending a glowing death beam at me, which I turned insubstantial and ducked under the floor to avoid before coming back up. Voodoo doesn't work that way, I shouted. You're making fun of a real-life religion, asshole. That was when Sister Christian fully recovered and landed in front of me, her eyes and hands glowing with hellish energy. She then blasted me with every ounce of power she had, which was considerable. I had to use all of my concentration to keep up the resulting contest of powers, and I was terrified of their cutting out at any moment. My abilities had been erratic since defeating Zul Barbas, sometimes allowing me to defeat gods and other times leaving me vulnerable to has-beens and never -wers. Today, at least, I was operating at a mid-range capacity and just barely holding my own against the pyrokinetic's attack. It's actually telepyrotic. Pyrokinetic is a creation of Stephen King in his book Firestarter, and he bungled the Latin. I don't give a shit, I shouted, turning insubstantial and going down through the floor of the cathedral. It was time to use one of my classic tricks. He's going to come up behind us, the Bokor shouted to his zombie goons. That's one of his favorite tricks. In fact, I came right back up to where I was, taking advantage of the steam cloud to come up behind one of the zombie goons and then pull on his trigger finger from behind. He shot another of his fellows and was subject to the retaliatory strike by everyone else's gunfire. The bullets were enchanted like Cindy's Uzis, so the zombie instantly disintegrated into a pile of bones. Emerging once more into the cathedral, I levitated up to the rafters and tried to figure out how to take down the bokor without damaging the stone, assuming he had it at all. Arranging this deal hadn't been my finest hour. No kidding, Cloak muttered. No need to give me any I told you so's. On the contrary, those are the high point of my day. Seeing there was a heavy set of wooden beams over the bokor, I moved my hands to freeze them and caused them to fall on his head. Nothing happened. Apparently my earlier assessment about my powers working at mid-range capacity today had been overly generous. Something was interfering with them and had been doing so since I'd cast the spell to bring Mandy back. Fuck! I shouted, which was about the absolute worst thing I could do when trying to remain stealthy. Sister Christian responded by throwing a series of fireballs up towards me, some landing against the rafters and others passing me by. The wooden beams proceeded to catch fire, and I was soon surrounded by a magical inferno, which would probably hurt me even when turned intangible. Magic was funny like that. The others just started shooting at me, which I did turn intangible to avoid. Shit, 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 I said, running along the beam despite my intangibility. Shouting into my carefully hidden earpiece, I said, Diablo Man, where the hell are you? Diablo Man was my second in command and the heaviest hitter I had on my payroll. During the late 80s, early 90s, he had been one of the most feared killers in the world. He'd possessed an army of satanic cultist followers, unimaginable resources, and the respect of his peers. He'd killed heroes and nearly destroyed the world on several occasions. Hell, there was even a rumor he'd succeeded in destroying the universe once. Obviously, it got better. Then he'd killed his superhero sister, fell in love, had a child, and decided being a complete monster sucked. I am trying to get to your position, boss, Diablo Man shouted, the sounds of moans and grunts accompanying him along with the sound of gunfire. 